Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you might be in the world. And welcome to our ninth annual Global Homeboy Network convening and gathering. My name is Steve Delgado, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Homeboy Industries. And this is our third session of the day. Uh, so for those of you who were not able to attend our first session on developing leaders from within, or hear Dr. Bob Ross's powerful keynote speech, uh, which is going to be tough to follow um, in this session, um, both of those uh, sessions will be available um, on a recorded basis on this platform for your viewing. So I would encourage you to go back and take a listen because they were outstanding sessions. Last year, when we gathered in August uh, for this uh, convening and gathering, we were five months into the pandemic. A new social awakening following George Floyd's murder was taking hold in the US, and the word pivot seemed to be top of mind as we were trying to figure out how to navigate in a new world. Now, a year later, we have successfully found our sea legs in dealing with uncertainty, and we all know that flexibility is an organizational trait that we must all embrace. We know too that COVID has impacted those communities we serve in significant ways, economically, emotionally, mentally, and physically. As Homeboy Industries Chief Program Officer Shirley Torres says, safer at home orders only work for those who have safe homes. Now, as we press forward in our missions, we are also defining a new way forward for our communities a new paradigm anchored in equity, justice, and economic mobility for all of us. Our constant refrain at Homeboy is that there is no us and them, only us. And this paradigm is one that we now pursue because there is no going back to the old way of thinking about things, that somehow some of us might matter more than others. Here in Los Angeles, we continue to see the opportunity to define a new way forward in alternatives to incarceration with new public funding models, leadership that is striving to dismantle legacy thinking in our criminal justice system, and a renewed spirit to collaborate and partner to pursue new ways forward. I'd like to quickly highlight two reports that we've talked about um, throughout the day already that are influencing thinking on this front. The first report entitled Care First, Jails Last, which was commissioned by the LA County Board of Supervisors, identifies health and racial strategies for safer communities. This report is the work product of a diverse group of thinkers and community-based organizations who formed an alternatives to incarceration work group under the leadership of Dr. Bob Ross, CEO of the California Endowment, who we just had the great fortune to hear from. The report outlines many innovative strategies and tactics in pursuit of a new ATI paradigm. And I would encourage everyone here to read the report and think about its implication in your community. A second report, which was published during the pandemic that we refer to today as well, is the No Going Back LA report, authored by the Committee for Greater LA. This independent report is a collaboration of the Committee for Greater LA, USC's Equity Research Institute, and UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs, and funded by philanthropy. It includes 10 guiding principles addressing areas from housing, economic justice, and mental and physical health to youth voice, immigration, and the role of the nonprofit sector in defining a new paradigm for creating equity and justice in our communities. Again, I would encourage those here to read this report as its guiding principles apply to us all in our various communities. As we consider our philanthropic strategies forward to enable our missions, reports like these impact our thinking. The reports impact those who are making public policy and those who are providing community philanthropy. Today, we're very fortunate to have two brilliant thought leaders in philanthropy 
who are working with mission-based organizations to define a new way forward and who agree that there is no going back. Joining us from the Carl and Roberta Deutsch Foundation is Jacqueline Chun. Jacqueline is Chief Program and Operations Officer at the Carl and Roberta Deutsch Foundation where she manages strategic grant making and daily operations. Jacqueline's work is focused on advancing healthier communities, achieving equitable access to education, housing and services, and providing community-driven solutions. Jacqueline is an incredibly thoughtful partner to organizations like ours who are working to make a difference. And I learn something important every time I have the opportunity to engage with her. So Jacqueline, it's wonderful to have you here today. And I'm also thrilled to welcome Danielle Campos, Senior Vice President for the Bank of America Charitable Foundation. She's here to share her time, her talent, and her insight with us, and uh, we so appreciate that. Danielle is the mem a member of the Environmental, Social, and Governance Group at uh, Bank of America Charitable Foundation, serving as a National Philanthropy Director for the bank and leading a team that delivers philanthropic programs focused on economic mobility for individuals and families. She provides direction on the development and implementation of these strategies across the company, domestically and globally, including volunteerism and thought leadership. We're lucky to have Danielle in Los Angeles here, uh, which means I get to chat with her um, as often as she has time to do so. And I'm a great admirer uh, of Danielle. So thank you for being here today, Danielle. Thanks, Steve. Absolutely. So, you know, to get us started in our um, in our conversation amongst uh, the three of us, I was hoping that um, each of you can just take a few minutes to um, share um, your insights with our global audience on how um, uh, things obviously have um, transformed not only over the past eighteen months, but really over the past year. From the time again, we were sort of trying to figure out where we were in the world and how we were going to approach things to 12 months later, as I mentioned, now that we sort of have our sea legs um, in terms of dealing with this uncertainty. Can you share just um, a few insights on the organization, what some of your priorities are, and how you're now thinking about things considering where we are um, um, in, in, this, in this pandemic and trying to get out of this pandemic? And Danielle, I'll, I'll start with you. Oh, great. And thanks, Steve, and thanks to Homeboy Industries for inviting me to participate in today's conference. Um, it's great to be back. And um, I know Homeboy is a, a critical partner of ours. And again, I'm glad to join you along with Jacqueline uh, on this panel. And it's, it's a very interesting time, as, as you mentioned, um, hard, challenging, and evolving. And I first want to start by acknowledging you and the organization. And you use the word pivot. And you know, amidst the amidst the coronavirus, um, you manage new objectives of the day to help the homies you served acclimate to virtual and online programs and services. So, um, congratulations! Thank you for all you do, and it really feels like the new objectives of of the day. Um, you mentioned the no going back report and how that serves as a backdrop for this year's gathering and. I'm proud to say that the bank was part of a broader group of stakeholders that launched the effort and made that report possible. And there are a number of reasons why um, the No Going Back report was so important. And I'm sure Bob alluded to it came at a time when direct service delivery organizations confronted the challenges of virtual environment and virtual programming. And they were forced to figure out like we all were, um, what do we do? How do we do this? And how do we work remotely from um, during the pandemic? And it really forced all of us to think about what we needed to do different going forward and to ensure that equity is part of, is, is opportunity. And so it was with these realities and the push from the philanthropic sector that the Committee of Greater LA was formed right after the pandemic hit. And again, as you probably heard already, bringing together the mayor's office, the corporate community, um, and labor and nonprofits to address the impact of the virus on our Black and Latino families. And they put out the data that speaks to the narrative change around the pressing issues that are impacting our, these communities, pressing issues of housing, homelessness, as you mentioned, criminal justice. 
and really compelled action in the areas of health and opportunity, again, for Black and Latino communities. Mm. And, you know, business has not been typically at that table on these issues and engaged with other key stakeholders. Um, but the pandemic changed everything, and there really was no playbook for us, and the entire business community was shut down. So this was a real tipping point for the bank. And not only in LA, but in all the 91 markets we serve across the country. So the bank's participation was a willingness to be part of that broader partnership of multiple realities and experiences when it came to racism, risk, and the work that needed to get done. And so leaders like Bob and others um, shared a desi desire to determine how we can have a common, common voices around these issues around especially those of us that were faring the worst and those who were going to be continued to left behind because for those that were falling behind went even further behind. And so we had to, you know, we had to be felt, we felt we had to be part of the solution and engaged to move our local economy forward. So again, um, as part of this ongoing effort, I'm, I'm happy to be here to share some insights on how philanthropy is, is interacting with community stakeholders and how we can navigate with each other this current environment. That's great, and uh, thank you for that. And, uh, we'll, we'll certainly follow up on that. And, and Jacqueline, um, certainly reports like no going back, and and other um, uh, thought leadership pieces have informed um, the found your your foundation and the Carl Roberto Deutsch Foundation and your view um, on grant making. Wonder if you can walk us through a little bit of your contemporary thinking right now in terms of what you're seeing and what you're hearing from funders and um, and just your funding um, premise. Sure, thank you. Thanks again. Um, I'll echo Danielle's thanks to um, both uh, Danielle and you, Steve, and to Homeboy Industries for inviting me to share on this panel. Um, I think you captured it well. It was, it was a moment of crisis I had never felt in this role, um, and I, you, you always feel this um, mission to, to serve and to respond to need, but there was this urgency to respond to. And in philanthropy, as many of you know, sometimes the uh, grant making process can take a while and it can from start to finish. And during that period, we learned um, that, that time was of essence. Getting money on the ground was um, key to supporting the community needs and to supporting the organizations that we partner with. And so I think, um, it really tested our faith in when we say we are a relationship-based funder, um, it really tested that. Um, and to do trust-based philanthropy in a real way of here, you need dollars. No questions asked here. Here's just, here's some additional money to help you on the ground. And I think that um, mentality is something that I think while we were in this crisis mode was always front and center. But as we move away from the crisis mode and Steve, as you mentioned, we start to get our sea legs, we're starting to get back into our operations is to remember those moments of crisis and urgency and remember what, those so silver linings were what great grant making and partnerships with nonprofit organizations came out of that. Um, there was a sense of we're in this together in a way that I had never felt. And, um, and I think we're all coming out of this in my relationships with other, uh, my grantee partners and with other um, foundations that we did this together and we were able to respond and activate as a community without um, putting everything else aside, like what are the outcomes going to be? What are, it was, what's the need? Let's get, let's address the need. And so I think we'll be looking at that a lot more is like really listening to community, ears to the ground. Um, I think the, the Committee for Greater LA really spoke, spoke to that community voice, bringing people with lived experience, people from the community, to the table so that they're part of the solution making that happens at um, institutional levels. And so that will be far more front and center. We've been, we've done some of that in our grant making, but we're really, you know, really seeing the value in that. Um, a lot more just uh, place-based work, um, really, really channeling funds into 
to certain regions so that we can um, move the needle in those regions rather go deep rather than going so broad all the time. Not that that's um, a bad thing, but really sort of complementing, doing, you know, complementary grant making in that way. Um, and really looking at how do we join forces with other other institutions like other funders, but also um, public institutions and really see where the, the gaps are and creating this like, I've been working on this 2000 piece puzzle. It's been <laughs> crazy, but really like seeing how how these pieces do come together, even when you're like, it's definitely not there, it's missing. Um, but recognizing that there are people on the ground, there are a lot of um, smart people here to, to find solutions. And so working together, having a more open ear. And, and so we'll be doing a lot more of that. And, um, and then continuing to build on our relationships with our grantee partners, just continuing to, to listen, to reach out to them. How's it going? What's your need? Um, how can we support you um, in getting to where you want to go? So I think it's, um, it's being really relationship-based, less institutional, and, um, and trusting in our partnerships. Yeah, just as a, that's great, um, uh, uh, Jacqueline, and just as sort of a follow-up to that, um, how does that um, orientation, and you've always been relationship-based um, for sure, but how does that sort of recommitment uh, to relationship um, impact um, grant uh, seekers um, from your perspective? So as we think about the relationship-based, um, and we're all in this together, what, what might some of your expectations um, be today based on that relationship-based mentality that maybe weren't mm -hmm. um, as quite prominent um, even a year ago, if there are yeah, already that's, some highlights? that's a really good question. I think, um, you know, in terms of grant seekers, not so much the partners that we have existing relationships with, which we do have close relationships with, grant seekers, um, our foundation's invitation only. So it has always been a challenge, truthfully, for organizations who don't have a relationship with us to sort of, quote unquote, get their foot in the door. Um, but I think having more openness to those introductory conversations. And um, while we've had them in the past, you know, um, just being more open to those and building off of those um, introductory conversations and starting to build and cultivate a relationship outside of just the funding relationship, but um, getting to know them and connecting them to other potential funders mm -hmm. and being a resource to the, those organizations that we may not be able to financially resource, but through, um, through some guidance and connections to other partners and just some, and thought partnership. Yeah, I would imagine based on the sort of all in it, being all in it together that, and we know this, that uh, many institutional funders have absolutely committed themselves to being those resources, right? To try and connect the dots mm -hmm. and where there's an opportunity to do that um, make sure that we can all sort of stay connected in that spirit. And Danielle, you mentioned the 91 markets that you're in, um, sort of a similar question um, that yeah. I just asked Jacqueline, how have you sort of seen the relationships maybe ebb and flow a little bit? And what are those expectations looking like in, in your world today as you think about the 91 communities that you're, that you're serving um, around the U.S.? Yeah, and I was going to mention relationship, relationship, and relationships over money. Um, so Jacqueline, uh, you know, we sh I'm sure most funders kind of share that mantra, but, you know, it's been, um, I've been with the bank almost, no, over 26 years. Mm. And um, the single most important focus of my work has been in philanthropy. So I've been able to work with local and national issues and addressing economic, economic mobility in our communities, then the issues we're tackling today are largely the same, although mm -hmm. exacerbated. Sure. But it is how we're tackling them that is very different than what we were doing even before March last year. So again, relationships over money, um, relationships with funders should no longer be transactional. But again, relationship-based and the first interaction with the funder should not be the ask for the grant. It should be 
your story of impact and 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 what the organizations are doing to move individuals families forward and many funders as like you heard from Jacqueline and funders like B of A recognize that our nonprofit community based partners are on the front lines of many critical issues in our communities and really face tough choices as, as they navigate through a challenging and economic environment. So, mm-hmm. you know, at Bank of America, we, 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 we need to get in there and make sure that our goals are aligned with you and be transparent about objectives and be part of the strategic thinking. And, you know, it has to be a symbiotic relationship. It goes both ways. And as Jacqueline mentioned, you know, we, 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 we want to talk about that leadership. You know, corp, as a company, we have a huge volunteer base we're sending, um, sending out um, some of our volunteers to deliver financial education and better money habits. So that in, in, in those examples, the corporate partnership is more than the dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know that those absolutely still matter and, and are, are key, but oftentimes the most successful relationships do not start with how much money. You know, we got to get to know each other, keep those communication channels open, build around the cause and the change we look to make and not the individual gain of your own organization. And, and it's important to know your audience because um, a lot of corporate philanthropy models use charitable contributions as a single investment tool, but that's not enough as we look to demonstrate, um, you know, the, as you look to demonstrate the value to our company. So again, avoid transactional transformation. And then we, when we talk about the transfer of power, uh, I know that's a, something that a concept that people are talking about. It's, it's about transfer of power, but shared success, looking at you know, what you're doing together and what shared success, um, tra- how that translates into the, into the work. So um, absolutely relationship-based. So echo, echo, echo what Jacqueline had said, but you know, from a corporate standpoint, we have other assets to bring to the table as well. That's great. And we'll get back to transfer of power um, in just a second. I'm glad you brought that up, um, Danielle. Um, you know, as, as we at Homeboy, and I'll, I'll just take a second to maybe share a bit with uh, uh, those who are joining us from around the country um, in terms of how Homeboy Industries is um, uh, currently working to a certain degree in our grant making. You know, uh, we've certainly noted many of the, of the themes uh, that you just alluded to. And, um, frankly, this has moved us um, back to evaluating, um, in many respects, our fundraising case, not necessarily to change who we are, right, right, but to affirm that, in fact, what we've been doing for more than 33 years is connected, right, to the ways in which our greater community is thinking about issues of equity and issues of justice. And, you know, um, one of the exercises that we've, we've conducted um, at Homeboy and is to actually map our programs and our theory of change to recommendations that have emanated from reports like the uh, No Going Back LA report, um, the Care First Jail's last report that I mentioned. Again, I think those reports are very applicable in um, marketplaces and communities around the country. So um, doing that and authentically framing our work along these lines has been helpful um, to us um, in mapping our priorities to the funding community, right? And um, connecting the dots just a little bit more, um, if I can, to um, the session that um, our chief program officer, Shirley Torres, um, led earlier earlier in terms of developing um, leaders from within. One of the themes that we've certainly um, heard um, and seen more prominently um, uh, on people's minds over the course of the past 12 months has been um, really empowering communities of color developing um, leaders with um, lived experience. And Shirley and um, our team at Homeboy spoke um, at length about um, that earlier today. This is a place where, again, we see this convergence right at Homeboy of um, sort of our strategies and tactics and how it is that we're thinking about that, right? So as some practical examples um, for folks who are with us today, um, we've sought funding to launch a leadership um, uh, launch an executive leadership development program, right? Working with an institutional funder to really identify those leaders in our organization that we know can be the next generation of executive leaders um, within the organization who have lived experience, right? Um, so as we think about that as a core competency and something that's central to our theory of change, how do we then go out to the marketplace and go out to funders and say, hey, here's what it is that we, I think we all agree about in terms of no going back. We've also um, worked with funders to build 
of more trauma-informed competency within the organization mm. uh, and under the nation and umbrella of really developing leaders from within. And then um, Shirley also mentioned earlier, and I saw some questions on the chat um, for those who uh, maybe were in, in both uh, in, in that session and this session, um, she mentioned our Homeboy Art Academy, which is um, really anchored um, in the development of young leaders uh, to enable transformative healing through the arts. So I just cite these as examples um, for um, those who are joining today as some sort of specific um, programmatic pieces that we've cultivated um, with um, the generous philanthropic community that sort of align with tenets of no going back and other reports that may be out there, right? Um, and, you know, our aspirations as an organization and really trying to work to find the intersections of those spaces, you know, to develop, you know, a partnership with other funders that will enable us to do those things. So I'm happy to um, offline um, share more about some of those initiatives um, and, um, and um, dig in a little bit deeper with folks. Um, but along those lines, um, uh, Danielle and Jacqueline, you know, and, and these themes that we're talking about, maybe we can do a little bit of a rapid fire kind of uh, Q&A on this one. Um, but some of the other um, notable um, themes that we continue to, that continue to be reinforced with us as we talk to um, generous institutional funders are, there are, for instance, DEI and DEI initiatives. Um, uh, Danielle, maybe you can talk a little bit to um, DEI and how important and, and relevant that is in today's grant making, um, and maybe even from the lens of, of the bank. Oh, absolutely, um, and that's impressive. I don't think I knew all about what you were doing and impressive work on the leadership development program. Um, we also have our own leadership development program, but um, I'll leave that for another time, but look it up, Neighborhood Builders, yep, um, uh, at Neighborhood Builders. I know Homeboy was a uh, Neighborhood Builder Award Great winner, program. and hopefully, um, I think a lot of uh, work was in success from that program. But, you know, DEI um, is really, it's about us bringing the whole company to communities, and, you know, it's the work of addressing social issues that's really not limited to a corporate citizen function, citizenship function. And, it incorporates input from those impacted, like you said, when decisions are made. And, and I would say one of the learnings is um, we have, after once the pandemic hit and then we made an announcement around um, how we were gonna um, address race equity and advance opportunity, we, we had um, listening sessions with our own employees and they've really become one of the most influential voices in our, on our investments in the community mm -hmm. and um, employee networks, where it's Black, Latino, the API community, they really, um, really were our, 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 our on the ground um, listening to what was happening in the communities. And so decisions were not just made by our philanthropic or, ES, or broader ESG team. We incorporated input by a number of key stakeholders, including the Black and Latino senior leadership teams across the company, and as I mentioned, employee networks and and I would say, you know, DEI was always thought of as a separate function, but it is embedded across all our lines of businesses. Mm. And when we do things like launch, launch a, a program like a jobs at initiative, it's not us owning it, it's in conjunction with our human resources, DNI, our lines of business. When we talk about criminal justice reform, it's not only talking about other, um, other again, cross lines of business, but we bring fields from the experts from the field to the table to speak to our leaders and get input on those impacts uh, and the strategy that will have impact. Because as, as Jacqueline mentioned, uh, as we know, proximity and, and lived experience absolutely matters. And you said that, Steve, but, you know, again, it, with D&I, um, it, it absolutely became so critical across every function of the company, whereas it wasn't just DNI over here. I would say every or, every everything I work on has a DNI manager. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that was something that was new. We had started thinking about it, but something that has really um, been lifted up over the last last couple uh, last year and a half or two. Great. Thank you. And um, back to this notion of the transfer of power, Jacqueline and maybe <coughs> Danielle feel free to weigh in as well. But um, you know, the, the um, notion of transferring power to uh, marginalized communities, um, using um, one's voice as an organization and um, really uh, through advocacy initiatives, 
wondering if you might be able to share a little bit of um, how maybe your lens has shifted a little bit into um, organizations that are um, maybe more ambitiously now pursuing um, um, that um, piece through advocacy work versus um, prior to the pandemic. Has, has there been any notable shift um, that you've been able to discern and not only within um, the Carl Alberto Deutsch Foundation, but maybe as you just see grant making across the board. And, uh, Danielle, happy to have you weigh in there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the, um, I think that in terms of the advocacy piece, um, we talked about this at some point, um, how important that is as an organization and as a community to be able to um, have the, the skill sets to be able to advocate for, um, for, for your community. And so when we talk about advocacy in the philanthropy space, sometimes there's this um, there's this misunderstanding about um, what is advocacy versus um, lobbying or, um, and we see advocacy as using your voice and, um, and creating leaders from the community to, to use their voice. And we absolutely um, are in support of that. And I think it's important for funders to be able to distinguish that, the difference between, um, because obviously many funders can't um, support lobbying efforts, but advocacy is, a, is an educational sort of pathway, a leadership pathway, and a building, building a community pathway. And so um, for, for funders, that's an important piece for us to be clear about that this is something that we would um, be open and willing to support alongside the the direct services that we may be supporting um, and have been supporting for many years. But they um, they really go hand in hand, and you can't really um, you can't isolate the two as and um, and feel that you're going to build community. And so, for the Carl and Roberta Deutsch Foundation, we've been um, long time supporters of advocate uh, advocacy and supporting um, building community transfer that transferring of power. It's been talked about a lot in the last year and a half, and um, and I think you know it's. It's not something new for philanthropy, but at the same time, I don't think it's sat as close to the front as it has um, today. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that organizations would bring to us and say, um, we're, we're you know, building leaders internally and, um, and it was always fantastic. That's great. Um, no arguments about that. Um, but now it's a question of like, how are you, what are you doing to build leaders within? What are you building? What are you doing to um, build community voice? What are you doing to empower, empower the community? And so it certainly is a piece that I think funders are looking at. We will add dollars on top of what we're supporting to, to, um, to build that in community. Mm. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, when you think about advocacy and supporting that work, we also leverage or use the you know vernacular systems reform and, and systemic reform and criminal justice reform are those forms of advocacy. So we find organizations that are thought leaders in the space because we know from a public policy standpoint, um, some of this is not gonna transform or be transformational and change society for the better unless you have a pub public policy lens and you're speaking to your um, congressmen and, and others and legislative bodies to, uh, to move uh, their money or appropriations. We're not going to get engaged with that activity, but we're going to get engaged in the, in, in the thought leadership that you bring to the table to move you know, move issues forward. Um, so it, I love how Jacqueline just, um, you know, made that distinction between political advocacy, but there's also advocacy when you think about advocating for real systems change um, to make society better. Absolutely. I think this last um, year and a half, 18 months or so, we've seen a lot of um, movement happening through community organizing and um, at the grassroots level, a change that we haven't seen um, in decades. And, yeah, and that's absolutely. all through people feeling empowered to use their voice. And, um, and that has been a real driver for philanthropy to look at that and see what do 
what are communities asking for? What is their need? What are they going out there and speaking out about? And how do we support that? And um, so it's been a it's been you know a difficult time for all of us, but it also has been a time that has shined a, a light, a spotlight on so many of these issues in so many ways. As Danielle, you said earlier, not um, what we're doing, but how we do it now. Absolutely. You know, two years ago, um, when we last had the opportunity to meet in person um, as part of the Global Homeboy Network, and I had the chance to um, visit with um, colleagues and peers around the country and around the world, one of the more significant issues um, for us as um, uh, mission-based organizations, community-based organizations, was, was housing and homelessness. Um, everybody, irrespective of um, the community that they were um, from, uh, spoke to um, that as a significant issue. Two years later, um, you know, pandemic aside, that issue has not changed, and if anything, mm -hmm. has um, only um, become uh, more prominent. Um, so I think there's a lot of folks um, on the um, on the line, uh, figuratively, if you will, that are thinking about housing and housing solutions for their clients um, right now. And um, we're one of them um, and we're working and trying to make strides in that space, certainly. Um, but um, Jacqueline, maybe I'll start with you. I, I know um, you, you've given some thought to this. Is there any advice that you might want to uh, share with um, folks on the line here um, about dealing with, with this significant issue and, and how to maybe contextualize it and, and think about making approaches on that front when it comes to grant making? Yeah, um, really tough issue. One that the Deutsche Foundation tackles regularly as well. It is one of our funding areas and um, we've invested heavily in this um, over the years. And it's, um, as you said, Steve, um, we've only seen it get worse. And, um, and it's not that there haven't been solutions that have been working. Um, it's just like, how do you stop the inflow? Um, how do you keep pace with the rate of homelessness um, for systems that are slow, um, these large public systems? And, um, and I'll take it a step further based on what um, you know, you said earlier about safer at home is hard when you don't have a safe home, but also, um, you know, we look at it at Deutsch's, not just a safe home, but how do you stay home? You know, how do you stay housed? What are those um, supports that you need, those continued wraparound supports that will keep you um, housed for the long term and that you don't fall back into homelessness because getting people housed is the easiest part in many respects. Once you find the housing here, uh, obviously we do have some challenges around um, having enough housing, but once you get them in, it's get them in, but how do you keep them housed? So in terms of um, organizations that are trying to approach funders, because we, um, because we've, you know, so many of us have been doing this for so long, we're not, um, we're not looking for something, um, you don't have to always come with, with something radical, radically different. There are things that are, that we're doing now that work, um, but we're also looking for some new creative, sometimes risky um, ideas. And, um, and in many ways, what the pandemic has also highlighted was what we talked about earlier, the, the beauty of these collaborations and the partnerships, you don't have to do it all. Um, and maybe your organization doesn't have the capacity to do it all. So where can you find meaningful partnerships with others um, in, in your community? Um, we're also really looking at, and we touched upon this also, at how do you create um, housing and homelessness solutions that take into account of those with lived experiences? How are you bringing them to the table mm. to be part of the solutions based on their experiences and really meaningful um, conversations with them, not kind of just um, as tokens of, of this issue. And so we're looking at, um, so if you, are able to look at 
ways to incorporate community voice. Um, what are the needs? What are the real needs? Um, what are the, the gaps in the system? How can you partner with other organizations to complete that puzzle I was talking about earlier um, around a continuum of services? You may not have the answers for the entire system of LA or wherever you're, you're um, you're working, but in your community, in your region. Um, and, and solutions that are culturally and um, ethnically relevant and appropriate. Um, we don't see things as working as a one size fits all. And so there are, we can't bring all models to all regions. Sometimes it just, just doesn't work. And that's why community voice is so important so that you can tailor the, the solutions. And so um, there are, you know, we talked about outcomes, what, what shows that what's working, what's not, but some ideas don't have outcomes yet. Um, some ideas are um, based on experience and um, a hunch that, look, this might work. And, and so it's, again, building that trust with your institutional funders and um, having sort of a, a history of good outcomes in your other programming and um, and having evidence maybe of other regions that have done um, something that you're trying to bring um, to your region. Uh, so, I mean, while I say, you know, philanthropy is trying to build on trust-based philanthropy, there still has to be some grounding. And so really looking at where you can connect those dots, but also um, funders trying to meet you at that table of, of you know, trusting your instincts, your knowledge, your expertise. Very insightful. And um, we've, we've had a number of questions that are um, gathering some momentum um, from um, our attendees. And Jacqueline, I think you just spoke to one of them. Um, I don't know if you have anything more to add because I'm um, incorporating community voice partnerships, no one size fits all. But um, a number of questions have been around the theme of how would you encourage organizations who are committed to experimenting? And we spoke a little bit about this right now um, with innovative upstream solutions to identify and cultivate relationships with unique investors willing to disrupt the status quo. Um, earlier, um, Dr. Bob Ross talked about um, um, folks who are disrupting in the right way. So really, you know, I think some of those themes that you just mentioned maybe speak to that. I don't know if there's anything else you would add to this notion of finding investors willing to disrupt the status quo and really thinking through those innovative pieces that may not necessarily um, uh, be fully, um, that may be more experimental or, or, in, or lean more toward the innovative side of solution making. Yeah, I mean, I can only speak for Deutsch's um, appetite for risk and <laughs> innovation, but um, certainly with our our existing partners and those that we have developed a relationship with, um, there is a level of trust there. There is trust there, and to be able to, and that's why we what we said before, it's all grounded in building the relationship with your partners, and that includes your you know, your community partners, your institutional funders, um, looking to us as not just the, the resource for dollars, but thought partnership, because it's through that, um, that uh, funders are able to feel like it's a safe risk, if there is one, like a, um, and one that um, even if it doesn't work out, that there are lessons learned mm. and what are the takeaways going to be. And so even if you have a funder that you don't have a relationship with, um, looking at how you present that around what are some of the, what will you do if it doesn't work? Um, what are some, what are the, your next steps do you think you would do if um, everything doesn't all your outcomes don't meet what you anticipate? Um, but really looking at sort of, 10 steps ahead and answering those questions for the funder. Like, we know you're gonna ask this, so we already thought about this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, now is the time. Now is the time to go, to go big. Funders have um, more openness around it. 
if you asked like five years ago, um, it would have been a lot harder. But today we know as funders and philanthropy, um, now's not the time to always play it safe. And now's not the time to um, stay stick with the old mold. And, um, and so there are funders that are looking for, think outside the box, get creative. Um, there's, there's uh, lessons to be learned from failure and um, quote unquote failure. But, um, but yeah, so that, I mean, I guess that's all I'll add to that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Anything just else? to add to that, um, I think funders, um, even probably individuals, and whether it's corporate, private, community, you know, we're, we are. We, there's been an overwhelming sense of humility in the last year and a half because, as Jacqueline mentioned, we've been funding in this space for a while. Whether it's housing, homelessness, workforce, health, and supported programs and initiatives. I was, like I said, I was here over 26 years, and I remember programs that we supported vestly deeply in the wake of the 1992 civil unrest. Then you had the 2008 financial crisis, but you're asking why 10 years later, there's been a little, there's been little progress. And so funders in the community and beyond have a, a renewed sense of, you know, looking about why we haven't moved the dial forward. Absolutely. We, you know, we look at sometimes as some of these um, grants is just putting the bandaid on, but it's, it's a time to think, broad, big, as, as Jacqueline mentioned, and, and go deeper. And, and we can't no longer continue to enable broken systems. So when we think about, you know, what we've done in the past, we are looking at different opportunities. We're leaning in on different issues um, like criminal justice. And I mean, five years ago, we weren't funding criminal justice reform organizations. Of course, we were funding Homeboy. We've been a funder for Homeboy for a long time, but that was because it's a social enterprise. It was our own work. But mm -hmm. again, when you think about systems changes, we got to get above that and look at different and innovative and effective ways to, again, move move the dial forward on, on something and some of these issues. And, and we, we as, I, <laughs> as I mentioned, we come to organizations with a sense of humility that we've been here for a long time, we've been doing what we can, but now we have to do it differently. And it's gonna take different models and paradigms to, to fund to do it differently. Thank you for that, uh, yeah. for uh, the optimism and the encouragement from both of you on, on that front, which is great to hear. Um, just again, as a bit of information sharing on Homeboy Industries um, part, um, and this may be more of um, uh, to the Fundraising 101, um, uh, um, topic, but we probably this year and maybe over the past 12 months have spent a lot of time um, doing research um, of potential funding partners um, who might be open to hearing about different types of ideas, ideas that may not necessarily be um, as traditional um, in approach. Um, and this is a bandwidth thing for all of us, right, who are, all, you know, who are community based organizations, you know, who don't have lots of folks and um, or lots of uh, dollars to spend um, in this space. But um, we found that um, just going ahead and staying disciplined with our research and staying committed to like really seeking out new partners and, and going ahead and just um, sending notes, frankly, um, not to inundate either of you with notes, but sending notes to um, partners just to say, hey, here's who it is that we are. We'd love to just set up a conversation. Again, just um, to your point earlier, Jacqueline and Danielle, you, you also made it really thinking about um, we're all in this together and thinking about different institutional partners as being resources, right? That might say, you know what, that's a really interesting, um, you're, that's really interesting, but it's not really where it is that we are. However, um, have you considered, you know, this, um, um, you know, a particular organization, right? Um, and yeah. that, that's that's been a little bit of our work over the past as we've had the time and not staying in traffic and working from home and and getting that time back. Getting <laughs> Doing that working back. 24 yeah. seven as yeah, opposed getting, to yeah, 18. Yeah, exactly, right now, yeah. that we're, now that we're working around the clock, right? Yeah. To do that, but you know, it's, it speaks a little bit to this, a question that we um, have here, you know, as a new nonprofit um, is cold email an appropriate rate to reach out to professionals like yourselves or others in at, at other um, institution, institutions that may be in their neck of the woods to begin forging the types of relationships that you've described? If not, do you have any other suggestions for folks? Um, is it going back to the research piece that I just mentioned, or are there any other um, things that you might 
have any tips on for folks who are trying to forge those relationships and get going in, in different spaces? That's a great question. And we get that a lot, I think, because um, it, it's hard because a lot of funders, we are inundated with a lot of requests. Um, I would say it's it's not a bad way, um, but it's sometimes it's not the most successful way. Um, right. Sometimes you'll get a, a nugget where you may get a response. Um, and it's not because um, just from the funder side that we are like ignoring everyone or anything. It's just, there are a lot of um, competing demands. One thing I would, um, one of the ways I would recommend is um, ask one of your funders to outreach. Um, see if they know someone from another foundation. Hey, we're interested in um, applying. It looks like we are a great fit for this foundation would you be able to make an introduction? Mm. And um, and if they can't, I'm sure they have other, let me check if another colleague can. Um, truthfully, when it comes to, um, you know, organization success, we, we want everyone to succeed. It's just, there's a, um, you know, a resource limitation. And so we do want everyone to succeed. So being able to connect uh, organizations to other to funders and make that um, successful partnership is just as rewarding for us as get giving a grant to the organization. So I would recommend reaching out to your current funders or asking them for some time like do you have any other ideas? Even if you don't know of any other funders offhand, they may have some ideas of other funders um, that you may not know about. So I would recommend reaching out to your, re your current resources and tapping into those. Yeah, I, I agree with Jacqueline. It's, it's not the best way, but it is a way to hopefully get a foot in the door. Um, we also like um, Jacqueline run RF We'll run two RFPs a year. Um, the first one focused on indiv individuals and families, um, basic needs, workforce issues. And then the second on revitalizing uh, neighborhoods and community building and, and housing <clears throat> and um, small business. And, and so anyone can apply. Um, sometimes I say apply, get your foot in the door, <laughs> mm -hmm. take that time. So at least you're in, you're in the system and then hopefully um, you know, hopefully you can build a rapport with either a funder. It was we talked about relationships matter. And I would say a lot of, of, of grants I've done, uh, and again, I work nationally. I used to work locally a while ago, mm -hmm. but at the national level, a lot of grants I've, we've worked on have been, hey, so-and-so is doing some amazing work. We know this is a priority. Even would you consider talking to them? And again, it's that conversation that matters mm -hmm. and we you, you, you create that narrative and you catch me. I mean, when, when I talk to someone on the phone and it's, again, it's who are you about? What are you doing? What issues are you trying to solve for? And it's just a get to know you conversation. I know what you're all saying is like, how do I get to know you? It, it is, it is, I know, I know. Yeah. And it is sometimes that conversation and it could be a, non, a nonprofit partner. If you're part of a coalition, if you're part of a collaborative, why not engage your partners in, in, in sharing, you know, their relationships with you? I know sometimes it's, you could feel like it's competitive, but this is not the time to be competitive. This is the time to be, again, supportive of each other and, and moving it forward because we can't do it alone is what we've all been saying for the last hours. We can't do it alone. So I would, I would engage relationships that you do have to introduce you to the right people and I'll only apply for that grant too. If you know, again, if if you you fall within the strategy, don't 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 waste your time or another or you know the funder's time in having to review a grant if it falls way outside our grant giving um, priority. So that's another another advice. But it is it is about having that face time um, to get that grant. Yeah. I'll just add yeah, two things to that. Yeah. Um, one is that, um, you know, when we talk about once you do have the conversation, um, it's that's an investment. That's a great time to invest in building that relationship. Right. And it may not turn into a grant or it may not turn into a grant right away. Um, but investing the time to build and cultivate that um, is well worth the time. Um, the other piece is when you do, uh, to Danielle's point about 
only reach out to those that you think you fall within their strategies. If you do do the cold call e email, um, keep it short, but to the point, really point out the areas that you see alignment um, so that, uh, because if we get like a five page overview for an organization that we don't know, it's really it. hard to <laughs> invest the time to to read all of those, but if you can keep it to a quick email that really highlights your alignment, um, that's that can be intriguing and enough to at least perhaps get a response, a quick response, like let's learn more. That's great. Thank you for that. That's um, very good advice. Um, as we get ready to wind down here in just a bit, I wanted to switch um, subjects just a little bit because we have talked about partnership and how we're all in this together. Um, Dr. Bob Ross pointed out near the conclusion of his uh, remarks that the amount of public um, funding that is um, coming into the system is um, once is historic, right? Um, matching um, other great ambitions that this country has undertaken previously with the New Deal, and 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 um, and I wonder um, how you um, are both thinking about public-private partnerships. How you're thinking about community-based organizations in terms of their pursuit of public funding um, in your own grant making and how much time um, you know we should be spending on um, pursuing that public funding in light of um, the way that you're thinking about how much time we should be spending on that so um, i wonder if you can um, you can both weigh in on that a little bit <laughs> yeah i think they're they're necessary and critical as we think about addressing innovative models there was a time where we said Wow, they have so much public money, and they and it's not diversified enough. But I think when we look at public money, we worry about the sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely, we know that ninety an, a, a, an organization that's ninety five percent funded of, of of public money that as we know, whether it's the federal stimulus right now or PPP or or what other um, or uh, levels of funding or sources of funding have come out, that that that's going to end. And so we think about those public-private partnerships as so immediate and, and necessary. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think from a public policy perspective too, um, when you, you 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 have to be at the table of those conversations and 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 the business of the nonprofit sector should be being at the table on those conversations. So I think public policy, cross-sector collaboration, um, you know, those public-private partnerships are, are, are key and necessary at this juncture. Um, I would agree with that in many ways. I do think that in terms of organizations that maybe don't have any public funding yet and are exploring that, to really talk to other organizations and your peers about what it takes in terms of capacity to meet the requirements of a right. public grant, mm -hmm. a contract. Um, and and there are challenges around, you know, turning the, the money around. And so do you have the capacity to, the working capital, capital to sustain while you wait for reimbursements and um, just yeah. really looking at, um, you know, talking to your peers about their experiences and setting up your infrastructure so that you are able to receive and um, deploy those dollars. I think mm -hmm. for some organizations that are ready to scale their work, public dollars are um, necessary to do that because philanthropic dollars aren't there to really scale mm -hmm. um, there, you know, we may be able to sustain some pieces um, or drive innovation, but to scale up um, and to do that uh, effectively, the public dollars are really um, you know, necessary for that. Um, but I always advise organizations that are exploring it um, to, to not just go after the public dollars and yeah. then to sort of figure out as you go, like, because um, there, there are so, so many things internally that you need to have ready to be able to do, to be able to handle public dollars well and effectively. Yeah, I, I, I should probably note that you cannot count on government resources alone. They'll, they'll never pay the full cost. And, and to Jacqueline's point, have extensive reporting requirements. So I'll, mm -hmm. not always the right solution. So let me, you know, step back and say not always the right solution, but a solution if if, if you have the sustainability to meet things like, you know, some, I, I know uh, in LA County, I mean, 
they're overdue on payment to some of their organizations, right? So if people are trying are looking for that gap funding, and particularly, anyway. So I, I would just say that they're not. It's not always the 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 best solution, but definitely a solution if if you want to think about going to scale or other other, other opportunities. Yeah, that's 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 wonderful. Thank you. And uh, Jacqueline, you um, and Danielle, you mentioned reporting. I know we talked a little bit about this, um, uh, Jacqueline, um, in offline conversations. Um, certainly, many um, institutional funders have changed their reporting um, uh, schedules and such um, during the pandemic. If you had to sort of look forward into your reporting crystal ball, <laughs> uh, do you think that's going to be a phenomenon that's sort of uh, has some stickiness um, amongst institutional funders, or do you think we're going to slowly find our ways back to um, um, reporting standards pre-pandemic? If I'm going to be completely honest, I think we're going to find ourselves um, going back to some degree. Yes, mm. um, you know, as uh, funders that are truthfully investors, we're investing yeah. in your organization. We're investing. Um, we also need to know if we're being ef effective in our investments in a, where we are choosing to put the dollars to move the dial on where uh, we as an organization want to go. And we don't know that if we don't get some feedback, um, some reporting from our organization partners. Um, I think that funders will be far more flexible in terms of what they ask for in reports and um, and may not ask for the same level of um, detail, but we still would like to be able to touch base in some way. And, um, and you know, calls and meetings are um, fantastic, but it's honestly the capacity for all of us to do that for every grantee is really difficult. And so just realistically speaking, I think there will be some finding our way back, but maybe not fully where we were, um, because I think we, we've seen that not everything needs to go back to the way things are. And as we talked about, no going back. Um, so really, <laughs> what are we, what are we pulling the best out of these past 18 months and carrying those things forward? Yeah, I would add, Steve, um, we're being asked to be accountable. I mean, inside a Bank of America, we put in, put out $1.25 billion over five years, of which half is philanthropy. Um, large initiatives are coming out of this, of these grant opportunities. Obviously, local 91 markets, they have their own funding um, strategies, but we talk about these national bigger grants. In four years, if we have a grant that's over four years, guess what, we're building a measurement and impact tool because we wanna know, it, we have to be transparent of what we said that we were gonna accomplish through a jobs initiative, for instance, after four years, did we move the dial? Did we? Did our hypothesis prove out? So I think in, in different scenarios, you're gonna have funders asking for those impact and measurement and reporting. Um, and, but if you're, you know, we're not going to ask the organization that's providing that we're providing five, twenty, you know, ten, fifteen thousand for a ma major report, right? And that we're funding annually. But from a, an accountability perspective, with this new new initiative we have, we absolutely absolutely are being asked by our leadership to show how you move the dial with, you know, precious corporate dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And I would I would say that, you know, don't think of the reporting always necessarily as a way for us to keep tabs on how well yeah. you're doing, but it really is to keep us in the loop in this partnership because we're not there day to day. We don't know the ins and outs, but at least like we get a sense of like, oh, what were those challenges that you had over the last six months? Um, what are you going to do with the lessons learned from those six months of things that didn't quite meet your anticipated goals. Um, and so it really is, again, reframing the way we think about this is a report due because they want um, to keep an eye on us. It's more about like, we want to know because we're partners in this work with you. And when you share challenges, sometimes we call and say like, what can I help you with here? And um, so it's, it is, um, there is a lot of value that comes out of the reports. Well, Danielle and Jacqueline, we're humbled um, to hear your insights today. And I know um, folks around the world will take uh, lots home with them um, as a result of this session. So thank you. And I'll close by asking you maybe to, um, with, with um, 
uh, to maybe um, share two things. Uh, one would be um, uh, a piece of parting advice for um, those of us um, who are mission-based and working in our communities um, as we look forward over the next half year to year. Like, how are you thinking, you know, what, what, what one piece of advice would you give us? And then we have a question from the audience, which is a big question, which is, what one change would you like to see over the next 12 months um, as a result of our work together um, in, you know, in community as um, Jacqueline, you said, you know, we're all in this together. What would be the one change? So one piece of advice and, and one, one change you'd really like to see so that next August, maybe it's we're all together in person next August, but aside from that, um, can you share um, those two things? And I'll, I'll go ahead and start with you, Jacqueline. Oh, okay. Um, the one piece of advice, let's see, I would say, um, I think we touched on this earlier is uh, look at us as partners, as your institutional funders as partners, mm. and, um, and that we're, we want to see you do well, and we want to support you in doing well. And so really look at, a, at us as a resource and um, not someone that you're just reporting to um, with like uh, metrics or something. And so uh, I think that um, the more we can we can break down these these barriers around, um, you know, what relationships were traditionally in in the past, and really look at this as we're all in this together. We're all partners in this um, puzzle, and we all have a role to play. And so, how do we all support each other in doing really well in each of our roles, so that our communities benefit? Um, the one thing I would love to see changed in a year. Oh, that's a big question. Um, it is a big question, Jacqueline. I'm there with oh you. But, you know, if there, if I had a magic wand, what would I want to see see change? And um, so I, I, I'm, I'm with you, Jacqueline. <laughs> uh, it's I guess as a yeah, as a funder, I would if I were to ask our grantee partners. Um, how did we do as a funder? How did mm. we do in terms of being a partner and um, and keeping you know us accountable and in sort of the things that we say we want to see and we want to do mm. um, that Steve, you'll come back in a year and say you've seen um, a change and mm. one for the better and one that showed meaningful. Um, meaningful effort to be partners in the community and um and that we'll we'll have these some solutions to these issues that we're grappling with these big issues that have been challenging but so necessary thank you for that jacqueline danielle any um parting advice for um our participants here today well, if you think about leadership, I would say um, for the leaders out there, don't lead from the top down, work from the bottom up, because that's where, you know, the real um, thinking fits, fits on the ground that's coming, those innovative ideas are coming. Um, I actually mentioned accountability matters. And so that would be a final thought. Just remember, accountability does matter. And then I think from 12 months from now, I think it's going to be more than two or three, it's going to be a little longer, but, you know, this notion of race equity at the center, having to remind people that race equity is at the center, I wish we could get, have that not be the term, but in order to uh, stay on, on target, I know it has to be, but, you know, the whole idea of color, people of color, people of communities, we've got to find a different, I think, vernacular for that. Um, and if we could find that, that'd be great to see that in 12 months or 14 months. But um, I, 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 wish, I wish there was another conversation that we could be having um, in a year from now that isn't so focused on how we're helping, you know, some of these communities move forward. But it's going to have to have to stay on, the, on, the, on I know we're going to have to stay on track with it a lot, but I wish change would happen quicker. So that's that's all I have to add. <laughs> well, that's great, and thank you both. And if I can take a little bit of moderators, moderators, yeah, um, please uh, privilege here, I would say that um, you know to uh, follow up on both of your um, uh, optimistic views, of <laughs> thinking big, and and using this time right as a time that we should not let pass. Right, we yeah. should all be thinking about 
no going back, what are those paradigms um, that lay ahead, and really going for it right now. Um, and I know if we have um, partners like you to follow up on those paradigms, um, we'll be in a much different place. So thank you again, uh, Jacqueline. Thank you, Danielle, for your time. Thank you. It's been a privilege to, to, to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Have a great rest of the conference. All right. Have a great care. day. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye.